Chapter Seven of the Men in the Walls by William Tin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Ever since early childhood, Eric remembered looking forward to ceremonies of this sort. A stranger would have been caught by one of the warrior bands, and it would be determined that he was an outlaw. Nine times out of ten, such a man was easy enough to identify. No one but an outlaw, for example, would be wandering the burrows by himself, without a band or at least a single companion to guard his back. The tenth time, when there was the slightest doubt, a request for ransom to his people would make the prisoner's position clear. There would be a story of some unforgivable sacrilege, some particularly monstrous crime that could be punished by nothing but complete anathema and the revocation of all privileges as a human being. The man had escaped the punishment being prepared for him. Do with him as you will, his people would say. He is no longer one of us. He is the same as a monster. He is something non-human, so far as we are concerned. Then a sort of holiday would be declared. Out of the bits and pieces of lumber stolen from monster territory and set aside by the women for this purpose, the members of the female society would erect a structure whose specifications had been handed down from mother to daughter for countless generations, all the way back to the ancestors who had built the record machines. It was called a stage or a theater, although Eric had also heard it referred to as the scaffold. In any case, whatever its true name, most of the details concerning it were part of the secret lore of the female society, and as such were no proper concern of males. One thing about it, however, everyone knew. On it would be enacted a moving religious drama, the ultimate triumph of humanity over the wickedness of the monsters. For this the central character had to fulfill two requirements. He had to be an intelligent creature, as the monsters were, so that he could be made to suffer as some day mankind meant the monsters to suffer, and he had to be non-human, as the monsters were, so that every drop of fear, resentment, and hatred distilled by the enormous swaggering aliens could be poured out upon his flesh without any inhibition of compunction or fellow-feeling. For this purpose, outlaws were absolutely ideal, since they all agreed that such disgusting creatures had resigned their membership in the human race. When an outlaw was caught, work stopped in the burrows, and mankind's warrior bands were called home. It was a great time, a joyous time, a time of festival. Even the children, doing whatever they could to prepare for the glorious event, running errands for the laboring women, fetching refreshment for the stalwart guarding men, even the children boasted to each other how they would express their hatred upon this trapped representative of the non-human, this bound and shrieking protagonist of the utterly alien. Everyone had their chance. All from the chief himself to the youngest child capable of reciting the catechism of ancestral science, all climbed in their turn upon the stage or theater or scaffold that the women had erected. All were thrilled to vent a portion of mankind's vengeance upon the creature who had been declared alien as an earnest of what they would some day do collectively to the monsters who had stolen their world. Sarah, the sickness healer, had her turn early in the proceedings. Thenceforth she stood on the structure and carefully supervised the ceremony. It was her job to see that nobody went too far, that everyone had a fair and adequate turn, and that even at the end there was some life left in the victim, because then at the end the structure had to be completely burned, along with its bloody occupant, 
as a symbol of how the monsters must eventually be turned into ash and be blown away and vanish. And mankind will come into its own, she would chant, while the charred fragments were kicked out of the burrow contemptuously. And the monsters will be gone, they will be gone forever, and there will be nothing upon all the wide earth but mankind. Afterwards there was feasting, there was dancing, there was singing. Men and women chased each other into the dimmer side corridors. Children whooped and yelled around the great central burrow. The few old folks went to sleep with broad reminiscent smiles upon their faces. Everyone felt they had somehow struck back at the monsters. Everyone felt a little like the lords of creation their ancestors had been. Eric remembered the things he himself had done, the things he had seen others do on these occasions. A tremendous tick of fear rippled through his body. He had to draw his shoulders up to his neck in a tight hunch and tense the muscles of his arms and neck. Finally his nerves subsided. He could think again, only he didn't want to think. Those others, those outlaws and previous ceremonies of this sort in Old Lang Syne's long past, was it possible that they had experienced the same sick, bewildered dread while waiting for the structure to be completed? Had they trembled like this? Had they also felt wetness running down their backs? Had they felt the same pleading squirm in their intestines, the same anticipatory twinges of soft, vulnerable flesh? The thought had never crossed his mind before. He'd seen them as things completely outside humanity, the compressed symbol of all that was alien. One worried about their feelings no more than about those of the roaches scurrying madly about here in the storage burrow. One squashed them slowly or rapidly at one's pleasure. What difference did it make? You didn't sympathize with roaches. You didn't identify with them. But now that he was about to be squashed himself, he realized that it did make a difference. He was human. No matter what mankind and its leaders now declared him to be, he was human. He felt human fears. He experienced a desperate human desire to live. Then so had the others been. The outlaws whom he'd helped tear to pieces. Human. Completely human. They'd sat here just as he did now. They'd sat and waited for the festival and its agonies. Only twice in his memory had members of mankind ever been declared outlaw. Both cases had occurred a long time ago, before he'd even been a warrior initiate. Eric tried now to remember what they had been like as living people. He wanted to reach out and feel companionship some sort of companionship, even that of the dead. The dead were better than this beaten, bloody man next to him, who had subsided into half-insane mumbles, his battered head on his torn, wound-scribbled chest. What had they been like? It was no use. In the first case, memory brought back only a picture of a screaming hulk just before the fire was lit. No recollection of a man— no fellow human in mankind. And in the second case, Eric sat bolt upright, straining against his bonds. The second man to be declared an outlaw had escaped. How he had done it, Eric had never found out. He remembered only that a guard was severely punished, and that bands of warriors had sniffed for him along far distant corridors for a long time afterward. Escape! That was it! He had to escape! Once declared an outlaw, he would have no hope of mercy, no remission of sentence. The religious overtones of the ceremony being prepared were too highly charged to be halted for anything short of the disappearance of its chief protagonist. Yes, escape. 
But how? Even if he could get free of the knots which so expertly and so strongly tied his hands behind his back, he had no weapon to hand. The guard at the entrance would transfix him with a spear in a moment. And if he failed, there were others outside, almost the entire warrior strength of the people. How? How? He forced himself to be calm, to go over every possible alternative in his mind. He knew there was not much time. In a little while the structure would be finished, and the leaders of the female society would come for him. Eric began working on the knots behind him. He worked without much hope. If he could get his hands loose, perhaps he might squirm his way carefully to the entrance, leap up suddenly, and break into a run. So what if they threw a spear through him? Wouldn't that be better and quicker than the other thing? But they wouldn't, he realized. Not unless he were very lucky and some warrior forgot to think straight. In cases like this, when it was a matter of keeping, not killing a prisoner, you aimed for the legs. There were at least a dozen men in mankind, with skill great enough to bring him down even at twenty or twenty-five paces. And another dozen who might be able to catch him. He was no Roy the Runner, after all. Roy! He was dead and skewered by now. He found himself regretting the fight he'd had with Roy. A stranger passed by the storage burrow entrance, glancing in with only a slight curiosity. He was followed in a moment or two by more strangers going the same way. They were leaving, Eric guessed, before the ceremony began. They probably had ceremonies of their own to attend, with their own people. Walter the Weapon Seeker Arthur, the organizer, were they at this moment sitting in similar storage burrows awaiting the same slow death? Eric doubted it. Somehow he couldn't see these men caught as easily as he and his uncle had been. Arthur was too clever, he was certain of that. And Walter, well, Walter would come up with some fantastic weapon that no one had ever seen or heard of like the one he had in his knapsack right now, that red blob the weapon-seeker had given him. Was it a weapon? He didn't know. But even if it wasn't, he had the impression it could create some kind of surprise. It should make them sit up and notice, Walter had said back in Monster Territory. Any kind of surprise, any kind of upset, and he might have a diversion under cover of which he and his uncle could escape. But that was the trouble, his uncle. With his hands bound as thoroughly as he could now ascertain they were, he needed his uncle's help to do anything at all, and the trap smasher was obviously too far gone to be at all useful. He was talking to himself in a steady, monotonous, argumentative mutter, his upper body slumping further and further across his own lap. Every once in a while the mutters would be broken by a sharp, almost surprised moan as his wounds woke into a clearer consciousness of themselves. Most other men in his condition, Eric judged, would have been dead by now. Only a body as powerful as the Trap Smashers could have lasted this long. And who knew? If they could escape, it was possible that his uncle's wounds, given care and rest, might heal. If they could escape. "'Uncle Thomas,' he said, leaning toward him and whispering urgently, "'I think I know a way out. I think I've figured out a way to escape.' No response. The bloody head continued to talk in a low, toneless voice to the lap. Mutter mutter, mutter, moan, mutter, mutter. "'Your wives!' Eric said desperately. "'Your wives! Don't you want to get revenge for your wives?' That seemed to be worth a flicker. Mm, "'My wives,' said the thick voice. "'They were good women, real good women.' 
They never let Franklin near them. They were real good women. Then the flicker was over and the mutters returned. Escape, Eric whispered. Don't you want to escape? A thin, coagulating line of blood dripped out of his uncle's slowly working jaws. There was no other answer. Eric looked towards the entrance of the storage burrow. The guard posted there was no longer turning from time to time to glance at the prisoners. The structure outside was evidently nearing completion, and his interest in the final preparations had caused him to take a step or two away from the entrance. He was staring off to the left down the great central burrow in absolute fascination. Well, that was something. It gave them a chance. On the other hand, it also meant that they had scant moments left to their lives. Any time now, the leaders of the female society would be coming to drag them to the torture ceremony. With his eyes on the guard, Eric leaned against the rough burrow wall and began scraping the imprisoning knapsack thongs against the sharpest edges he could find. It wouldn't be fast enough, he realized. If there were only a spear point in this place, something sharp. He looked around feverishly. No, nothing. A few tumbled bags of food, over which lazy roaches wandered. Nothing he could use to help him get free. His uncle was his only hope. Somehow he had to rouse the man, get through to him. He squirmed up close, his mouth against the trap smasher's battered ear. This is Eric. Eric the only. Do you remember me, Uncle? I went on the theft, Uncle Thomas. I went on the theft with you. Third category, remember? I asked for a third category theft, just like you told me to. I did my theft. I was successful. I made it. I did just what you told me to do. I'm Eric the Eye now, right? Tell me, am I Eric the Eye? Mutters, mumbles, and moans. The man seemed beyond intelligibility. What about Franklin? He can't do this to us, can he, Uncle Thomas? Don't you want to escape? Don't you want revenge on Franklin, on O'Teal, for what they did to your wives? Don't you? Don't you? He had to cut through his uncle's confused mist of gathering delirium. In complete desperation, he lowered his head and sank his teeth into a wounded shoulder. Nothing. Just the steady flow of argumentative gibberish, and the thin blood dripping from the mouth. I saw Arthur, the organizer. He said he'd known you for a long time. When did you meet him, Uncle Thomas? When did you first meet Arthur, the organizer? The head drooped lower. The shoulders slumped further forward. Tell me about alien science. What is alien science? Eric was almost gibbering himself now in his frantic efforts to find a key that would unlock his uncle's mind. Are Arthur the Organizer and Walter the Weapon Seeker very important men among the alien sciencers? Are they the chiefs? What was the name of the structure they were hiding in? What is it to the monsters? They talked about other tribes, tribes I never heard of. How many other tribes are there? Are these other tribes? That was it. He had found the key he had gotten through. Thomas the Trap Smasher's head came up waveringly, dimness swirling in his eyes. Other tribes. Funny that you should ask about other tribes. That you should ask. Why? What about them? Eric fought to hold the key in place to keep it turning. Why shouldn't I ask about those other tribes? Your grandmother was from another tribe, a real strange tribe in a far-off burrow. I remember hearing about it when I was a little boy. Thomas the Trap Smasher nodded to himself. Your 
Grandfather's band went on a long journey, the longest they'd ever taken, and they caught your grandmother and brought her back. My grandmother? For a moment Eric forgot what was being prepared for him outside. He'd known there was some peculiar secret about his grandmother. She had rarely been mentioned in mankind. Up to now he'd taken it for granted that this was because she had a son who was terribly unlucky, almost the worst thing a person in the burrows could be. A one-child litter, after all, and being killed together with his wife in monster territory, very unlucky. My grandmother was from another tribe, not from mankind. He knew, of course, that several of the women had been captured from other peoples in neighboring burrows, and had the good fortune now to be considered full-fledged members of mankind. Sometimes one of their own women would be lost this way when she strayed too far down an outlying burrow and stumbled into a band of stranger warriors. If you stole a woman from another people, after all, you stole a substantial portion of their knowledge. But he'd never imagined— D Dora the Dream Singer! Thomas's head wagged loosely. He dribbled words mixed with red saliva. Do you know why your grandmother was called the Dream Singer, Eric? The women used to say that the thing she talked about happened only in dreams, and that she couldn't talk straight like other people. She could only sing about her dreams. But she taught your father a lot, and he was like her. Women were a little afraid to mate with him. My sister was the first to take a chance, and everyone said she deserved what she got. Abruptly, Eric became conscious of a change in the sounds outside the burrow. More quiet. Were they coming for him now? Uncle Thomas, listen, I have an idea. Those strangers, Walter, Arthur the organizer, they gave me a monster souvenir. I don't know what it does, but I can't get at it. I'll turn around. You try to reach down into my knapsack with the tips of your fingers and— The Trap Smasher paid no attention to him. She was an alien sciencer, he rambled on, mostly to himself. Your grandmother was the first alien sciencer we ever had in mankind. Uh, I guess her tribe were all alien sciencers. <laughs> Imagine a whole tribe of alien sciencers. Eric groaned. This half-alive, delirious man was his only hope of escaping. This bloody wreck who had once been the proudest, most alert band captain of them all. He turned for another look at the guard. The man was still staring down the length of the great central burrow. There was nothing to be heard now but a terrifying silence, as if dozens of pairs of eyes were glowing in anticipation. And footsteps. Were not those footsteps? He had to find a way to make his uncle cooperate. "'Thomas, the trap-smasher,' he said sharply, barely managing to keep his voice low. "'Listen to me. This is an order. There's something in my knapsack, a blob of sticky stuff. We're going to turn our backs to each other, and you're going to reach in with your fingers and fish it out. Do you hear me? That's an order, a warrior's order.' His uncle nodded, completely docile. I've been a warrior for over twenty old lang zines, he mumbled, twisting around. Six of them a band, Captain. I've given orders and taken them, given them and taken them. I've never disobeyed an order. What I always say is, how can you expect to give orders if you don't? Now! Eric told him, bringing their backs together, and hunching down so that his knapsack would be just under his uncle's bound arms. Reach in. Work that mass of sticky stuff out. It's right on top. And hurry. 
Yes, those were footsteps coming up outside, several of them. The leaders of the female society, the chief and escort of warriors, and the guard watching that deadly procession was liable to remember his duties and turn back to the prisoners. Hurry! he demanded. I told you to hurry, damn it! That's an order! Get it out fast! Fast! And all this time, as the trap smasher's fumbling fingers wandered about in his knapsack, as he listened with fright and impatience to the sounds of the approaching execution party, all this time, somewhere in his mind there was wonderment at the orders he was rapping out to an experienced band captain and the incredible authority he had managed to get into his voice. Now, you're wondering where your grandmother's tribe have their burrow, Thomas began suddenly, reverting to an earlier topic, as if they were having a pleasant conversation after a fine full meal. Forget it! Get that stuff out! Just get it out! It's hard to describe, the other man's voice wandered on. A long way off their burrow is a long way off you know the strangers call us front burrow people you know that don't you the strangers are back burrowers well your grandmother's people are the bottom most burrowers of all eric sensed his fingers closing in the knapsack the three women who ruled the female society came into the storage burrow. Otil the omen teller, Sarah the sickness healer, and Rita the record keeper. With them was the chief and two band captains heavily armed. End of chapter 7